Ben, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Declarations of conflict of interest. Are there any declarations to be made? Uh, with item seven. Okay, thank you, Matt. Lisa, did you have your hand up? No. No, okay, moving on. Matt is lying on the table. We have the CCTO manual that's lying on the table and that will return to council at the meeting on the 23rd of March, 2023. Right, I have two special two special announcements. Neither of them are pleasant, but we'd just like to acknowledge the passing of Pete Hensby, uh, General Manager of Property and Infrastructure since November 2014. Um, on behalf of all the councillors and the governance team, I want to pass on my condolences to the family, uh, for staff, as what I experienced during that week. He was definitely a high-regarded colleague a mentor and a friend. So, and also I want to acknowledge the recent passing of Ian Kirkland of Glenorchy. Ian was a councillor for three terms, 1992 to 2001. He was a fierce advocate for Glenorchy and was a very active and reliable councillor. He was a member of the Works Committee Infrastructure for nine years and chair from 1995 to 2001. Um, he drove and pushed for the ceiling of the Glenorchy Road. So I pass on my condolences to the family. Right. Public forum. Number one, John Glover. John, three minutes. Time is yours. Good afternoon, Matt, councillors and staff. Me and Kirkland was here today. He'd start with, you people need to listen. <laughs> so, here we go. And that was Ian. And everyone knew it would, would, would see the human. So, you know, when it comes to finding opportunities, I'm speaking to item one on your agenda, the same of expectations. When it comes to finding opportunities for councillors, to exercise good governance around the airport. It's a bit like finding eggs in Queenstown right now. There aren't any anywhere. Uh, but I'm asking you to govern, and I'm asking you to amend the statement of expectations to require the QAC strategic plan to be approved by councillors who are the representative of the community who own 75% of the airport. Now, we should never have had to ask for this because it should have been councillors, not QAC, who should have defined the strategic plan and strategic outcomes for the airport. The priorities, the purposes, the what and the why. And then direct the board to get on with it. That's how governance works. The community is heard, councillors act and the board deliver. Now I work in the world of community engagement and the community is pragmatic and, it's, uh, and it knows that uh, there's always trade-offs and things are never easy. But what's creating a festering sore and a lack of trust year on year is the continual denial for community participation in a where to from here discussion around the airports. And that's what you've got to leave. That's what you're elected for and that's what people expect. Now that's not an easy thing to facilitate, but hey, welcome to the real world. The alternative is we just ask chat GP and see what it comes up with. Would be quite insightful, but then you'd have to ask the question of what's the point of having council or sit down with a governing. Um, don't be fooled, the strategic plan is key to absolutely everything. It is the most important document. It's like it's you should own it. It's and if you're told otherwise, just keep asking why. Yeah, and amending the SOE won't delay it. It won't delay the SOI. Now it may delay consultation around the master plan, but that's the risk that the board will have taken when assuming the community will be happy only discussing the how and the why rather so the how and when rather than the what and the why and the two are totally different there will be a difference between the two so um uh, to make it even take a bit of time i've got a, some words on page uh, asking you to amend uh page two of the foe item a uh, to require that the qac board submits the uh Strategic plan to councillors for approval. And I'm hoping that when you come to discuss that item, you may be able to give that some consideration. 
Thank you very much. John? All good. All right. Next, Lee's Lee. <laughs> Same again, three minutes. All is yours. Um, thank you, everybody, for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Leslie Van Gelder, and I'm speaking uh, as co chair of the Southern Lake Sanctuary and also chair of the Plenarchy Dark Sky Sanctuary. Um, and I'm speaking about the destination management plan and want to give my enthusiastic support for it um, from our sector because I think it's an extraordinary first step for the district and the boldness of the projects that have been posed and the actual story of people coming together to work on such a complex um, question and one that's so important to the district can't be underestimated. So. Just to remind everybody that the process, um, I think I was involved in it all the way through. It was long and consensus is a difficult thing, but it's remarkable how far it's come. To that end though, I've got three recommendations because I can't leave without them. Um, the first is that speaking to project nine, which is of course the, the big project, I'd like actually the council to consider being bolder or to project to being bolder and to making a full circle of regenerativity and to look at the idea that all of the carbon that we sequester, we sequester within our own district. We have the conservation community to achieve this. We would be the first place in the world that could achieve the circularity. And for us to do that, that would make us world-class. Um, so we can figure this out. And once we do that, we're a model to the rest of the world. So I'd like to encourage Project 9 to be bolder and to be truly regenerative because it will also regenerate um, in the economic diversification space our economy that we are growing in the environmental space. So let's link those two things up. To that end, my second recommendation is that it's time that we have a, a working group for um, Tatayo for the environment for council. Too many of the plans require knowledge of the environmental sector in this district, a sector that was not visible five years ago and is now one of our largest areas of growth. And it's really important that all of these different plans, whether the spatial plan, whether um, the DMP, whether the economic diversification, they require the interweaving of that knowledge of the people on the ground who are doing that work now. We have the equivalent of the Council of Elders and Kaitahu, and council should consider um, making that a working group to help all of those strategic areas flow together better because we can think better about ecosystems and ecosystems people. My final point is wearing my dark skies hat, as most of you know, we're trying to get dark sky sanctuary. Um, and in the plan, and because I'm from the Northern Hemisphere, this stood out to me. Um, our carbon zero is not our North Star, it's our Mount Um, Let's use the language for our beacon and our beacon project to be a language of beacons, not of stars that we can't see in our sky. We obviously want to see the stars in our own sky. Um, and so it's, it's a small thing. Obviously, everyone saw it and either looked at it and went, ah, I know what that means. But we can use our own stars to guide by and we should. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, Lizzie. Thanks. Pierre. Kia ora katoa My name is Pierre Mahasti, and I am speaking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion. This first council, council meeting of 2023 is a good time to look back at the past year. Globally, 2022 was the fifth warmest year on record making the last eight years the warmest so far. While for New Zealand and many other countries, it was simply our warmest year ever. Our ocean temperatures were the warmest on record too, which contributed to the record floods we experienced both here and around the world. But last year wasn't only wet, the world also experienced record droughts. Here in March, Auckland was already being flooded while Southland was in other roads, a sign of things to come. All these events have had a high human and financial cost. Starting with the human cost, worldwide, tens of millions have been displaced by extreme weather events. Here in New Zealand, 1,200 people were displaced by the Nelson floods alone. In the US, 3.3 million people got displaced by weather events, and six of them never came back to their homes. 
Millions more are being displaced by the East African climate-induced famine, and a staggering 32 million Pakistani got displaced by the catastrophic floods that submerged a third of the country. Sadly, last year, many simply died due to the consequences of climate change. Financially, 2022 was the costliest year so far. The direct economic cost of extreme weather events is estimated at 360 billion US dollars. Here in Aotearoa, insurance claims reached a record 335 million. But let's not forget that these costs are far from covering all the extent of the loss experienced by affected people. 2022 was a bad year, but we already know that 2023 will be worse. The consequences of the Oakland floods will be felt for years around the country. And this disaster is unlikely to be the last one happening to us this year. We are in an emergency and we all need to make the decarbonization of our lives a priority. But as councillors, you also have the responsibility to reduce the emissions of our district. <clears throat> to do so, we need to be clear. At a district level, nothing is meaningful if we do not drastically reduce the airport's emissions. And the only real way to do so is to reduce the number of flights landing here. It did happen for two years. We know that it is possible. And now we need to reduce air traffic in the long term because the laws of physics are not negotiating with us. Token gestures alone will not improve our situation. And our situation is slowly but steadily becoming unmanageable. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Julie. Good afternoon, everybody. Julie Scott from the Queensland Lakes Community Housing Trust. Nice to see so many new faces around here today. I'm here to speak to item number two, which is, of course, our Tibber Banks project down in Drop Street. Um, it's going really well at the moment. We're ahead of schedule on Earthworks and we're hoping to appoint uh, civil works construct, uh, contractors next week. Um, but before we can sign any further, contracts and agreements, we do need to be able to obtain finance for that. Currently, um, we have a bit of an issue because we typically use the land that we're building on as security for financiers, but we can't do that with the Tiller Banks land or the Drop Street land as it currently stands. It's worth the dollar. That's the price we bought it from council for, and that's, of course, the price that it must be sold back to council if, um, if, it's ever, if it ever leaves trust ownership. So... We're in a bit of a predicament. We don't have other assets to use as security for financing. This is a $50 million project. So we um, really do need to find a solution to the incumbents issue. It does need to be lifted. It's, um, it isn't, doesn't sit over any of other, our other assets that we've received from council or has been facilitated through council. So it is, I guess you'd call it almost, it was a, a pilot um, and it hasn't really worked, but we're, confident that the proposal that's in front of you today, the Covenant and Gross, will work. So I urge you to um, accept that recommendation and go ahead and so we can get on with the build. We've got 68 homes to build. Um, we've got 870 households on our waiting list as at today. 80% of those are Queenstown based. So we've got a huge amount of interest. Uh, we've actually got a little newsletter update here that went out to, we initially started it for the neighbours. But um, there's so much interest, so I'm spreading it, sharing it far and wide. Um, we do have good financing in place, subject to this encumbrance issue being resolved. So ASB has um, shown support at a high level in principle to go ahead, subject to the encumbrance issue being resolved, and also mm -hmm. the government's Ministry of Housing and Urban Development through the Progressive Home Ownership Loan. We've got a um, significant application in front of them for a 15 year interest free loan, but again, they need that security over the land. So, um, yeah, that, that's all I had to say, and I'll, I'll leave these with you as a little bit of an update. And thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, <clears throat> 
I'm going to talk to the DMP from the 2030 decarbonisation plan. So putting it in context of where we are um, at the moment in history, it's like as if we're on a jet boat and we're currently going at speed on the lake in this big body of water that's called the universe. We have limited materials and energy on that boat and we're suddenly realizing that the engine out the back which is our economy is really starting to cause us problems our hull is getting really leaky and we're starting to sink we need to do something about it but we can't just flip out this energy source from petrol to electricity because we are limited in terms of energy and materials on this boat we actually have to have a full transformation of our economic system into a sailboat. So while we're still traveling, we have the challenge of changing from this boat, which is a jet boat, into a sailboat and build the mast, sew the sails in order to keep us going. And we have to do it within the limits that we have. This is gonna be really transformative and we need to be able to tell the people on the boat, including the ones at the front who are still partying and they think that party is gonna continue, that the party is now over. We need to let those know at the back of the boat who are absolutely terrified that it's okay. This is where we need plans such as the 2030 decarbonisation plan. If we do not endorse it and get behind it as a community, we are just kicking that can down the road further. It's really important that we back it. It's not perfect. There's a lot to be done, but we need to start somewhere and this starts somewhere. A couple of recommendations. Uh, that we have at WOW is we need to get the community at the centre of this. So those organisations such as the Southern Lake Sanctuary, Y, all of our um, all of our environmental organisations that are really frantically with a lot of voluntary labour patching up their hull, we need to find ways to actually finance them to do it better. Jobs for Nature funding is going out the door. How are we actually enabling them to do this better? We also need to put community education at the heart of this. We need to actually let everybody know, party goers and those terrified included, what is going on, how is going on, why we are transforming and how we can transform better and keep everyone informed at the same time. Second recommendation, we have to use science-based targets. We cannot offset. We do not have enough land to offset. So offsets are not an option. We need to decarbonize very quickly, but we also need to recognize a little bit like we do for our diet. We have a limited calorie intake per day to keep us in a fit state. It is the same with energy. We cannot just make ourselves more efficient because what that does is actually the more efficient we get, the more energy hungry we get. We need to pull it back. We have to never forget that equity has to be at the core of what we do. We have to think about how this is actually going back and feeding and benefiting our community. Always keep it there. When we're in a sailboat, we sail differently. It's about teamwork. There's not one driver up the front shooting us around the canyon, making us scared. It's teamwork. So we need to do this together. So please enforce the DMP with what a start. Let's get going. Thank you. Is it for public forum? So, I require confirmation of the agenda. I'll move that the agenda be confirmed without addition or alteration. We have a seconder. Thank you, Matt. Correction, if you want to be pedantic, go to page six, paragraph four. Paragraph four, page six. Frederick Conger. Mm -hmm. He's being scooted up with Inga. It's the minutes. Well, it's the minutes. Oh, so what do you do? Okay. <laughs> You're proving the agenda. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, no. I've got to hear them myself. No, no. I get, get them before everyone else. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I read the minutes. <laughs> I've moved that the agenda be confirmed without additional alteration. Matt has seconded. All those in favour? Aye. 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 I should carry it. Right. Aye. You ready? Aye. You ready now, Wild? You ready? <laughs> Confirmation of minutes. Ordering meeting of the council held on the 15th of December 2022. Have we got the. Mm -hmm. yep. So we've changed to beam scooters. Right. Is it just the heading? It's not the contents, is it? Yeah. It's just the heading, yeah. There you go. 
I move that the minutes of the public part of the ordinary meeting of the Queenstown Lakes District Council held on 15th of December 2022 as amended be confirmed as a true and correct record. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Barry. All those in favour? Um, motion carried. Item one, page 22 on your council papers. SOE. Megan. And I've asked Brendan to. Oh, and Brendan. Hello, Brendan. Today. Thank Hi, you, Linda. Um, first of all, um, councillors, I would just like to acknowledge the presence of um, Curiosity Board member um, Simon Clark, um, the Chief Executive, Ben Sowery, and General Manager Sir Blue Line um, And I'm happy to take papers as read, although I did wonder if it was helpful. Um, because I uh, noted um, John's comments in public court, and I don't know if he's still here. Um, I thought it would be helpful to very briefly acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, this is an issue that um, we traversed very closely last year. Um, it was certainly something that councillors had a very close look at. And um, long story short, um, the um, QAC uh, basically outlined uh, very clearly uh, their responsibilities under the uh, multitude of acts that they need to adhere to, um, the um, consultation that they would need to undertake that goes above and beyond community consultation, such as with the airways, such as with their tenants, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and clearly outlined to this council a year ago uh, why um, they needed to leave that consultation. But as we'll see, and as you'll know, councillors, in the statement of expectation, we clearly do outline our expectation to be firstly um, uh, to have uh, feedback sought from QLDC on that master planning process, and, uh, and that once the process has been undertaken, with the QAC, uh, by the QAC, that they will come back to us for endorsement of that master plan and present the, a summary of all of the feedback that they have received from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it may not be the silver bullet that uh, John will see today, but um, this council will be very closely aligned with that master plan piece. And other than that, I am happy to take the papers with you. Yeah. Councillors, questions? Effort yeah, just a question and then, then I'll make a comment. Um, I just remind me here the involvement of AIL, AIL, uh, in the statement of expectation. They're a shareholder, are they, are they involved? Or? No, this is our statement. Do they do one? Uh, I don't. They, they've chosen not to in the past, okay. um, but the law actually doesn't actually really very well recognise whether there are multiple shareholders. But um, we we took some advice last year and, was, and had determined that we're entitled to make this statement on our own. We have provided it to the AIAL as a courtesy. Okay, well, I support the uh, statement, just my comment. Um, and I'm talking about the governance side of it. You know, we are governance for a council, but uh, we engage a board for the QAC, and that's their governance uh, body. Uh, so we're the shareholders, we put through this statement of expectations, is my understanding, the board will produce their strategies and, that, and for the CEO to go over on and develop a master plan, which we just heard we're going to be uh, actively involved in. So I support the statement of the expectation. I do, getting down into the noise, the editorials, when this is an official document, we tend to, uh, might seem minor, we, we, we use QLDC and council. Uh, we don't use a standard term throughout the document. One minute using QLDC, next next council, and the same with master plan. One minute it's master plan, two words, and then it's only one word. So uh, editorials, but I think for an official document, we should uh, be looking pretty smart. Thank you. Thank you all. Any further questions? Councillors? Um, um, you got a question? A question, yeah. Just, just wondering why then at five, look, that's plain from Dan but um, why it said that council and ILS shareholders of QS, QAC make to make the expectations for the company to be met. You see that? Sorry, point five. That's why the question. Yeah, that's why I was asking. I'm just, I'm just wondering if it's accurate because we we get a lot of comments from the community around the accuracy about 
reports around the airport. So I'm just wondering if it's accurate. Then so my understanding, yeah. yeah, no, thank you. I think my understanding is AIL do have the opportunity to also have a statement of expectation. Do you know what piece of legislation that sits under? Because I don't think it's under this, under the Local Government Act. Uh, it will be under the first schedule to do when we work talks about a shareholder may um, have a statement of expectations. Um, I don't think it's may, exclusive. Yeah. Under 64B, statement of expectations, the shareholders in a council controlled organisation may prepare a statement of expectations. But if you keep so, reading, if you keep reading, all of the um, clauses under that relate to the local to a local authority. So it, I think it's probably just a wording thing. Um, it, I, yeah, anyway. I, but I, it'd be good to clarify that. Um, I suspect, Councillor, it's, it's actually that the, the, yeah. the schedule does, doesn't actually nuance itself with the fact that you could have um, a, the situation that we find ourselves in. But yeah, yeah. Uh, my understanding is AIL have chosen not to have statements of expectation in the past. Yeah, that's fine. I'd just, I'd just like it to be clear in the governance manual exactly what's required and what's not and who has rights and who doesn't. Um, and we haven't agreed that just yet. Um, look, just one more thing. I was going through last night and I've seen some stuff around the council. It's just about the um, significance and engagement policy. And I just wanted to clarify, so when, obviously this one was put through as low significance, and I think you're probably right given the content of it, but that's the question. So when the statement of public um, intent comes back, would I be right in saying that it is the content of the statement of intent that will determine whether it's of high significance or low significance, so that if it is given the considerations that are in there, so that if it is not aligned well with our policies, then it pushes it up the line, and would mean that we would potentially have to go out and do a bit more engagement with the community on it. Yeah, and so that's one part of the, the picture. The other part is whether or not the significance and engagement policy would apply in a way that would call for the community consultation. There are provisions in there that would need to be weighed up at the time around other statutory processes that sort of. Um, uh, I followed instead of the, the the full consultation process that the council would otherwise go through. So um, it, it may be a position where um, the council decides that there's not enough time, for example, it's only a two month window um, between when you get it and when commentary has to be provided. And there's also a, a number of other things in the Local Government Act that talk about community access to the statement of intent once it's been produced. The ability for council to you know discuss it and potentially modify it, that sort of thing um, and all of that weighs um, against um, a community consultation process under the significance and engagement policy if you if you decide that there's, a, there's an alternative statutory process and that doesn't really enable the, the I guess even if it's not a statutory process sorry through the chair um even if it's not a statutory process, but it's something that the councillors are looking at and going, this is one of our strategic assets, um, given the considerations and the quality, it's actually of high significance, therefore, do we as a group want to sit around? The reason I say that is that we actually haven't had, the community hasn't had the opportunity, other than some select stakeholders initially to feed into the document, and there's certainly been no opportunity to review the final one before the board approved it. So I'm just looking at our processes, and given the significance of this thing and, and you know the impact it potentially has on infrastructure and so on, um, I'm just wondering, you know, I just wanted to put it out there that we might need to think about that because we've never sort of considered it in the context of that policy, not around this table explicitly. So Mike, do you want to pick that up further? Um, look, I'd, I'd have to go back and check the legislation. It, it would seem very unusual um, that, you know, this is a this is a commercial trading company on, but that is owned by the council. Um, the council uses the SOE um, process to express its views to of its expectations. It is a dialogue with its own entity. I will certainly I'll go away and have a look, and if there's if there's 
if there's something to come back to, we can always come back to it at that time. But I, I think I'm, the, just, I, I'm not across that part guess, of the legislation. I guess for me, it's just a, that we're making a decision on the SOI, depending on the content of the SOI, it will have a significance rating, just like the SOE has a significance rating. And given that, there may not be no statutory obligation um, specifically, but some of those are judgment calls that we need to make around the table. So content-wise, and I just think that's something that we need to think about in the future. I, I think if you, yep, noted, and um, and I can understand that comment entirely. Um, when we have considered, like, so last year, for example, we um, we stated that the SOI was of high significance, uh, and we will be doing that again. Um, but we also did give advice that the SOI and this was based on legal advice at the time, Mike, um, was not a matter for public consultation. Um, and um, that was in last year's paper. We can certainly have another look at this. I've gone away and had a look um, just to have basis covered should this question arise. Um, it's certainly not something that other councils do uh, in terms of the SOI process. I mean, I guess ultimately the SOI does, it is actually the, the board's statement of intent um, it's our job to either agree it or not. If we don't agree it, we can seek for it to be modified. But I think going back to that comment I made um, in relation to John's um, um, statement in public forum, um, there are uh, inordinate complexities to running an airport and, um, and that is not, we can't expect that our community will be um, able to make informed comment um, based on that level of complexity, and that's why we have a board. Okay. Any further questions, mm -hmm. councillors? Do I have my own? Oh, well. well, I'll move one, note the contents of this report, two, approve the Queenstown Airport Corporation Statement of Expectations 2023, and three, authorise the Mayor to sign the letter. The, le the letter on behalf of the council. Do I have a seconder? I'll second. There we go. Do we have any comment? Do you have a comment? Excellent. Well, I do have a comment. Um, look, I think just, just to answer the point from um, our staff, um, you're the strategic, you've got to get the, the difference between the operational and the execution of the strategic goals and the and the and the strategic goals themselves. To me, when I read the strategic plan, the goal is to, to grow to meet demand. It's a key assumption, but it's also the goal and around that there's a, another lot of objectives that need to be achieved. And that's to me for us to set. And then how the airport goes about that is is the board's job. Um, and look. There's a big discussion there to have about do we want to grow the meat demand? And to me, it's a huge elephant in the room because we haven't had that discussion with our community. And at some point, very soon we need to. And I'm hoping it's the destination management plan that triggers that because there are discussions in there around capacity. Um, so yeah, I'm grateful for that. So I just wanted to speak to that. Um, look, there are two things that I wanted to bring up that concern me. One is that we're sending an SOE through, which isn't bad. I don't think there's there's some really good stuff in there, but um, for me, there's no hierarchy in the outcomes. It's a bit like the Natural Work Environment Bill that's, that's come out that we're having discussions around that going, look, there's a whole bunch of outcomes, but how do we know which ones we're waiting more highly? What are the priorities? And so I think we make it very difficult for our board by not doing that. But to do that, we have to have that big discussion. Um, the other issue that I wanted to, I just wanted to speak through for the board, and I, the board's obviously not at the table. Um, no. But there are a couple of things I just want to clarify just for councillors and my meaning um, around it. So um, we've got some points. Sorry, I just need to find it on that. Um, so at B, says the plan must align. Hang on, councillor. Questions are over. This isn't questions. I'm speaking to it and I have five minutes. Are you asking questions? I'm not or asking something? a question. I'm just clarifying my position. So what okay. I could do at the moment is I could go through and I could make a bunch of amendments on the wording in there because I don't think it's clear. Um, I just want to be clear for the board what I mean, and for the, the councillors and for the record what I mean. Um, it says the plan must align um, with the outcomes um, in the plan and the destination management plan. Um, so for that, I think there needs to be a carbon accounting assessment of 
of the master plan before it goes out for consultation. I think our community needs to understand when it looks at the master plan um, what the carbon footprint is and what the carbon emissions that are enabled by the growth of the terminal. So if that's happening, that's great. Um, the, that's C, sorry, glasses are tricky. Um, the master plan must be endorsed by full council in the 23-24 um, after the QAC has sought feedback from the community. Um, my, my read of that is that it should be that the master plan can't be implemented until it's been endorsed by full council. It's just a wording thing, but I just wanted to raise it. Um, and the last one is at D where it says council would like QAC to also include an understanding of its oversight of aviation emissions. We had some discussion and look, my interpretation was that we would like QAC to report on the emissions enabled. So report on New Zealand and so on aviation emissions. So I just wanted to, to note that. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yeah. I'll, you go back. No, no, no. Look, I, this this issue be, has become a battleground over the last couple of years. I don't think this is the the battleground to die on today, and I think that we are in a, a place where um, that this new council are getting their head around um, this issue for them for the first time, and we're doing that in a productive way. I think this SOE reflects broadly the the what we're asking um, of the the QAC to present in their SOI, we will have an opportunity to get in front of the board, which is actually really important. And the, um, some of the QAC, when they present the SOI to us, which I think is a really important step for the new council. And um, and equally, the, the current SOI provides for the master plan to provide a, an important step in that. We don't even know exactly what that um, looks like it, but I think it's fair that we give that an opportunity to help fulfil that consultation and strategic direction role um, with our community. So, with that in mind, I'm, I'm, I don't think it's I don't think we've completely resolved the issues around how council steer our um, CCTO. But I think you know this is a step on that journey, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Right, Lisa. Sorry. Um, I'd probably just like to offer some assurance to our community at the level of engagement and discussion and reading and back reading and round and round the table we've done with this and every topic in relation to the airport and how seriously we're taking it. And we talked at length this morning around um, the principles of good governance being um, determining the purpose of our um, air transport network and that our community is well served by a future proof. Um, air transportation network that serves our region well. Um, we talked at length about effective governance culture and um, this pivot point between the strategic 10 year plan and the master plan. And we each of us feel that that sits. And I'd like to express um, that we were, well, my personal opinion, but I've heard from um, some of my colleagues around the um, belief that we have strong representation at our boardroom table and that we have confidence in the level of engagement that they're inviting us to have, um, that the land use plan with the master plan, of course, that's an area that council um, are required to sign off on. However, that strategic plan, um, when we're starting to dive deep into um, the how of how this um, agency will deliver things like how they operate within the air noise boundaries or what the customer experience is. Um, in my opinion, that is very much in the hands of our uh, board and our directors and for us to have noses and fingers out to let them get on with it. We've given them clear guidelines about not exceeding or expanding those noise boundaries. I'd like to see that um, you know we really work positively with our board and giving them the confidence um, that they represent us well. Um, the holding to account and the effective compliance, the last of the two pillars of governance. I think we've got clear indications in our SOA and our evolving living documents of our manuals, um, and I look forward to seeing the SOI and, and being further engaged with our board um, to pull off the objectives for our community. So. Thank you. I guess my final point is I don't want our community to feel that we're not taking this seriously and that we're not um, really holding each other to account on the work that we're putting in behind it. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Councillor. Right, motions before you. We have a mover and a seconder. So all those in favour? Aye. Aye. All those against? Motion carried. Thank you. Item two, Jock Street Encumbrance, page 28 of your papers. Who do we have before us? Michelle. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, I'd like to take this report as read. I'm joined by technical expertise, Vanita Vanstone, our strategic growth manager, and our general counsel, Brendan Pete. Um, in principle, this uh, this report is effectively asking for an in, in principle agreement to continue. There will be detailed work needs to follow this, um, but it's going to need some careful attention. Um, so this would not be the end of the story, but it would set us in the direction to come and have questions. Right. Questions, councillors? Yeah. Councillor Pete, you want to um, yeah, so you know, I'm just I'm just doing the extra discussion because I just had a few thoughts around will we be limiting the borrowing given the risk? Just just as a question, you don't need to answer it. Um, will we require any sort of oversight over the building to make sure the management of it is keeping within their sort of boundaries? Um, and can we help them if they look like they're about to default and see some? Is there a facility to, to do that? Ignoring the borrowing, you know, our, our capex issues, but technically, would there be a way to do that so that it didn't completely fall over if they ran short a little bit? Does so, that make sense? So, addressing those three parts, yeah. um, with regards to the financial component and whether or not this um, limits the borrowing, but the conversation we've had today is that this would be sufficient with the borrower that they have in place. Um, obviously, as a, a, as a market value, it's, oh, sorry. My question was, would we limit? So, would we want it to go beyond fifty? If if the lender would go beyond, how comfortable are we having it extended out to sixty million? Say, or do we have an interest in keeping it at a level where we can manage the risk too? So, and Mon, Mon, I think council basically having taken the step. Um, you know, uh, I think is looking at what 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 is the potential level of risk. Or if there remains a risk, the ultimate um, fallback position for the council is to acquire the property um, back because we have an obligation back to the crown as a result of, of that. Um, we would never allow that obligation to fall over, so we would find a way to do that. I think uh, where we have confidence is that we're minimising the risk and that. The, the, the trust is a you know a, a trusted partner in terms of executing its um, it, its work. So I think we would have um, I, I don't know that we would seek um, any explicit uh, limitations on their ability to do this. Uh, and I would would hope that uh, if, if there's if there's a message that needs to be there that this this borrowing should be focused on actually delivering on key things. Not being borrowed for anything else, and one would expect that the bank wouldn't count them with that anyway. And it's great. Um, uh, with regards to the ongoing management and maintenance yeah. needs, there would be an enhanced monitoring that we'd need to conduct on the site to make sure that, that this continues to meet the requirements of the company. Oh, that's great. Look, then I look, there were questions that I raised just so just to see if they were front of mind and just moving into the process of things. I think we need to manage our risk as well. I'm fully in support of doing this. I just think we need to do it very carefully and make sure they have the capacity that they need to make sure this comes. So especially in the climate that we're in at the moment, um, when things are escalating, I just think we need to be careful. Thank you. I just have a quick question, Mr. Mayor. Um, just following on a bit from that, are, we, are they comfortable with the land value being enough security for a $50 million loan? That's what that's the advice we've received at this point in time. I mean, as we go, they can't get evaluation though. So that's right. Sort of mm -hmm. Do you have an answer on that one? I don't. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a question. It may restrict their borrowing. Though. Yeah, the fifty million might be an aspiration. Or they can't, if they haven't got the security for it. So I think this will come to fruition as we start to work up the terms of the covenant specifically and the tripartite agreement, and then we can continue the conversation with the trust and with the uh, lenders to make sure that we've got all those details. Um, now, I assume the uh, 50 million uh, that figure they keep putting they put in there or 68 hours that must the 50 million must go to putting in the streets and that too because that's a lot of money for 68 68 hours. Um, and then you talked about a uh, question about 
uh, affordable housing, tightly defined? Has that been done yet? No. No. And that's part of the work that needs to follow. Okay. This paper is about testing your appetite to increasing the risk slightly around this. Um, and if you give us in principle permission to continue, that's a piece of work that we next follow. Okay, thanks, Mr. Okay. Any questions? Just a, a perhaps a note to Councillor Cox, obviously, as, as you were inter interpolating. No, uh, there is a lot of uh, assets that go in there, so actually um, part of the security we exercise is the value of the assets we can get back, should that have to come back to us in the future. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, any further discussion? <clears throat> Brilliant. So, one, note the contents of this report. Two, confirm that council agrees in principle to removing the encumbrance and negoti negotiating an updated co covenant includes first right of refusal to council if covenant breached or the finances exercise power of sale, which can effectively balance the objective of delivering affordable housing against the risk and costs of loosening the strict controls currently in place. Three, Recognise that without removing the encumbrance, it is unlikely that the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust can proceed with the development of 68 affordable homes, the job homes in the Jop Street in the near future. Four, recognise the risks associated with removing the strict encumbrance, noting that these can be managed by the proposed covenant. Five, instruct council officers to draft an updated covenant that provides for QLDC with the first right of refusal if the financiers exercise power of sale and or the land stops being used for affordable housing. Six, delegate to the chief executive the authority to remove the encumbrance and negotiate, settle the terms of and execute the covenant and tripartite agreement on behalf of the council. We have a mover, we have a seconder. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. All those against? Motion carried on the animus. Well done, councillors. <laughs> Item three, destination management plan. Michelle states, but... um, I'm just welcome to the table um, backwards and Buck from uh, National Vehicle Spec of Deputy uh, Queenstown, from the Chief Spec of Lake One Tourism and Chair of the South Lake Conservation Board. Um, we felt it's important to share, share with you the, the scale of the partnership here at the moment and to present this as a united group. Um, this is the result of approximately three years worth of work. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that Peter Harris is not coming today, who is just a key piece of the work on the council side of things. Um, effectively, we're asking you to endorse this plan. I feel like I'm bringing this back to earth with a bureaucratic bump following Monique's um, beautiful metaphor earlier. <laughs> um, but essentially, we're, we're, we're seeking endorsement to be able to progress this plan, to work it into more detail, to pull together the right teams we need, and to pursue some pretty significant funding to make some of this work happen. Um, from the council perspective, Perspective, it's a key deliverable that was mandated through the spatial plan as a priority initiative as part of the Grow Well Fire Royal Partnership. Um, Kai Tahu are heavily involved in this work as is the Department of Conservation. It's very much about taking a systems approach to tourism as opposed to an industry or sectoral approach to tourism. Um, and it's about creating a movement, generating momentum. Um, you'll notice that the Keystone project of decarbonisation by 2030, that's actually only 2,882 days away from now. So there has been some progress being made, capitalising on the momentum of the work so far in shaping up Project 9 and really looking at the scope of it and what that's going to entail. That has so far involved a line-by-line -line assessment of all of our um, emissions as a district, the good, the bad, the ugly. We're including aviation, we're not shying away from anything at all identifying some gaps and some ways that we could move forward with this work. So it's already in train to a degree um, around that piece of the puzzle. Um, we're taking the view that decarbonisation is essential if we're going to achieve regenerative tourism. Uh, there are lots of other key themes addressed in this work. Uh, the community is at the centre of this. It's been a, a very significant community engagement process. Um, and obviously the environmental concerns are enormous in here. It's taking quite a broad span. It complements the economic diversification plan. Uh, we want the economic diversification to reduce our reliance on tourism as time goes by, and you'll be getting more details of that over the forthcoming months. But in the meantime, we need to use our dominant industry to drive significant change, massive change in the district. 
Um, and that's the opportunity that this work, I think, is seeking to pursue, um, and hence the recommendation. That's been Does anyone have any questions? We'll go with Lisa and then go, Lisa. <laughs> Um, I think the plan's looking great and it probably centres around this giving it some teeth around funding. I'm looking at Project 13 and Project 17 and wondering if there's sort of a schmush there um, <laughs> around visitor levy and originally we targeted just that showing impact back on infrastructure but we're really wondering whether there can be some tie back to our workforce housing and the conversations around developing that Project 13 and the visitor levy. Um, you know, I think we could quite easily draw some evidence around the provision of a visitor room targeting back to the need for a working room. Um, so just whether we can sort of think of Project 13 and Project 17 and, and partnership somehow. I think yeah. there's a lot of synergies across the board in some of these actions and it's a really fast-paced space, this. I think in the course of the time we've been working on this plan, we've written three completely different plans and been on quite a significant journey. Um, and as this housing challenge is coming into play as well, it, it's essential that it's woven into this housing, transport, and decarbonisation go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question, first question that I had last night was, um, this is a plan and we're endorsing it. It doesn't give it a lot of teeth. And look, looking at it, I, I can either choose to really cynical about it or, or, or to absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. I think we need something like this. Whether it seems realistic or not, I, I, I love it. Um, I, because of that, and because I want it to have teeth and I want it to inform our other decisions, I would love to see this as a strategy or policy. The moment we're endorsing a plan, gives it no teeth at all. So do you have any thoughts around that? Um, Mike may have some suggestions. Potentially, it could be adopted rather than yours. Well, I mean, I think again, it's not our plan per se. It is uh, it sort of sits somewhere um, um, remote from the council. We're, we're a key mm -hmm. part in it. I think endorsing it gives it the, the, the right position for us to 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 I was say to adopt. Um, it's a <laughs> logical death of time. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think the commitment for us will largely be in how we go about actually participating in its delivery. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the work, uh, the collaborative work that's already going away, particularly on Project 9, you know, very much got QLDC, uh, the RTOs at the, at the centre of this discussion. I don't know that we honestly don't know that we need to do much more than what we've done at this point. I, I do think it, it's also part of the spatial plan. So in terms of having teeth, it's, it's also reported up to that governance structure up to ministers. So it, it has this other sort of line of visibility. I'd like to answer that. Oh, sorry. I'll just jump in. Yeah, sure. I think from a personal point of view, if we show leadership in this space and really drive it individually as each councillor here sitting at this table, I think we, no matter whether we endorse it or adopt it, I think we can drive this plan to a great height and really force that change that this district has called out for and that we can really, really aspire to. So whether it has teeth or not, I think that depends on each and every one of us sitting around this table and driving it to that action space. So that's I that's where I stand on that. I, I don't see playing around with endorsing or adopting. It's a visceral drive for me personally. And I, as a, as a leader of this district, and as you are leaders of this district, we have to drive it. Just, just if I can finish on that, and look, I really appreciate that, and I agree with you. It's just that council processes are council processes, and when we consider levels of significance, we look at our strategies and policies and we look at alignment and when we make a decision, we're then forced to look at that alignment. If it doesn't align with the DMP, we have to go out for consultation. Maybe that's not the right thing to do today. Maybe we need to sit around and consider it, but I'd like this table to actually look at this some more and see if there's the potential for us to adopt it as a strategy and policy to give it some real teeth because I think that's showing real leadership. Thank you. Just, there were a couple more things that came, if I'm allowed. Uh, right. How many? 
um, they were just related to public forum comments. And look, I know this is this will be a living kind of thing, and, and projects within it will be able to develop things. Is there any chance that we can change North Star to Matariki? Or <laughs> I just thought that was kind of a neat concept. Um, and as you were looking at the carbon stuff, I, I do agree that if we try to keep it within the district, um, because there's some confusion around whether there should be offsets or not. Is it carbon zero? Is it offsetting? But look, at least let's try to keep it within the district. I do think that that could drive our local economy in the right direction. We could have growth without the loss of the growth, if that makes sense. Um, it was just a question for me. Thank you. Can I respond? Yeah, you go for it, Tim. I was wondering if you'd touch on that specific one about keeping it within the district. Yeah, so that, that's absolutely the intention, which is why we chose the wording carbon zero, not net carbon zero. Net zero gives the implication that it could be offset some distant land. We want um, and recognise that it's going to be impossible for us to eliminate all carbon at the source, so that nothing is ever omitted, at least at the start, um, until technology catches up, which means that if there is carbon being emitted, uh, the strategy is to have ways that we can extract that carbon locally. Um, and that the, the reasons for that have a whole bunch of benefits because, I mean, with native planting sequestration and waterways and all of that sort of stuff, the local communities get the benefits of it as well as the ecosystems locally. So absolutely, um, the intention is for it to be local. Uh, the other part of it is um, with regard to Matariki, I thought it was a great idea as well. Um, so it is an evolving plan over time. It's, it is a living document. So yeah, that's something that we'll certainly talk more about. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, following on a little bit from that, the question is: uh, it's not uh, the council's plan. So, who's the? I, missed, I think I've heard of a term in there about who's the person or people that are running with it. Because uh, there's a lot. It's there's a lot of words here. That's how the comment I've got. I think people get paid by the words rather than by the content. <laughs> and I'm a great fan for if you want to have more impact, sure, but now. Um, uh, but yeah, who you know, there's not a lot of statements on there. How are you going to achieve the project on it yet? So that's got to come. Who's driving it? Yeah, I, I think um, while it was a great answer to the mayor earlier that it's actually all our responsibilities, first and foremost. But um, we RTOs have actually set up um, destination management office, a DMO, to help actually um, deliver the plan because it is across the district. And of course, we have two RTOs in um, the district, one in Queenstown, one in Monica. So the DMO. Is, gives us that ability to do that. We also identify within the plan, there's lots of different pieces of the plan that sit within the RTO slash the DMO world, and there's other jobs that are already been done, so we can amplify those jobs that already started to happen. So it's not just all happening within the DMO itself. Um, I think the next piece to this is that, as you, as you see in our annual plans this year, the DMO will integrate with that, um, and that will pick off the jobs that we can start to do and actually can fund within our existing funding streams to do that. There's a lot of jobs here to do. We can't do that in one year. So we will be looking at the pieces that we can actually do in bite-sized bits and start ticking them off. Okay, because I, I do believe uh, the to make it work, you've got to get everyone involved, everyone sees this, but I'm just a wee bit nervous that the collaboration that you talk about here is maybe not as uh, strong throughout the community yet as we need. So it's going to I have a question. Do you have any comment on that? Do you think there needs to be more work done on that? Yeah, there, there, there will always need to be more work done, but the, the amount of work that's been done so far is has actually been quite astounding. There are There is collaboration going across numerous parties and community groups throughout the district, some of which are in the, um, in the public forum here. Um, but th those conversations and collaborations are ongoing, and we're looking at ways that we can streamline those to make them more effective so that we can understand better what each other are doing, whether it's around conservation, climate change, um, staff housing or, or whatever, so that each of us who have the best skills, resource or processes can lean into each other and leverage off what each other are doing rather than just having silo things replicating. And the other, the other questions, again, sort of comes back to what you, you were saying. I have, I have we have a bit of a problem and I get down there the definitions of words. I, I think in Dorset's, because not our plan, I'm just nervous and Dorset's basically says we approve it. Um, and I'm just worried that 
we might set ourselves up for something that the community may expect us to do as a council that we actually can't or we just haven't got the uh, power. And I, and I, I know it's words, but I'm more of a fan of supports the destination management plan. Oh, so I go there, yeah, the other way. I, don't know if I was going to actually uh, reserve the right to move an amendment on that, but I'd rather hear from other councillors first on what they think about that. Yeah, I just I'm a wee bit nervous about what it sets us up for. Even though we all want to do it, sometimes we can't always do it. Um, what I would say, though, is that as we've gone through this process, we've been really careful to align it with our other strategies, plans, and commitments. Um, so I, whilst there's potential in here for new names of work and new ideas, effectively, this is about just adjusting the way we work or the out that we have on things. I'd be reasonably confident that this isn't committing us onto anything that we're not already committed into and that we're starting to work towards at, from a purely purely and safe perspective. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, well, firstly, just to touch on that, I think if we've got Lyle pulling in one direction, Nikki pulling in the other, the middle is probably a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, secondly, um, you know, good work on this. It is a you know a step and there's a lot of work to follow and you want to acknowledge that that the, how this is implemented is more important than the plan itself but that's the that's the mahi that yet is yet to come so um take the mayor's point on board that we we're all need to own it we all need to um drag it forward um i was just interested in one you know, talked about words and language, et cetera. This economic leakage was sort of a new um, concept, I suppose, but just love you to speak to that briefly. And uh, yeah. So economic leakage, um, there's a term that we look at is how can we find <laughs> this district that has actually spent here? Um, and obviously we have um, ownership of, of various assets and infrastructure that could be owned offshore or booking agents that are booking. So are they, is that money being spent back in the district? Are they using it to help us with our um, project nine carbon zero goals? So you could be a company offshore, but if you're actually using those profits to benefit us within the community, that's a good thing. But if you're taking all your profits offshore, that's leakage that we want to you know, ensure that we don't have that. So ensuring that we can keep as much money within that. That's about making sure we see as much of the benefit of the industry and the opportunities for regenerative tourism as possible from the from the market. So, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, sounds like a useful concept. And um, yeah, I could work on the what you've done so far. Just touching on Lyle's concept, I you know I think we need to understand how much of your membership um, you have support from in this moving forward, but it doesn't change the fact of what we've got before us today. So, so thank you. So I think using rhetoric is a great uh, term because that really is a rallying cause. We have these the middle star and we should actually use this other hemisphere um, cluster, so that makes good sense. The membership has been really behind us. We've been quite surprised. In November, we socialised the concept. Um, and in fairness, we, um, we were just blown away with actually the support. You know, we thought we might have actually had to use eggs thrown at us, but it wasn't eggs because we've got an egg shortage. So that's the reason. But, um, <laughs> It was it was accepted um, throughout the membership, but more importantly, it actually rallied outside tourism, and I think that's the really cool piece about this is that the spillover is more than tourism. So although tourism is actually the um, you know the backbone or the big piece of GDP here at the economy, it's actually reached other pieces of the industry within the Queenstown Lakes, which is the exciting piece of this. You want to vote? Brilliant. So what? The recommended option? Oh, I would like to move more, but I think we're stuck okay. in the middle of everything now. <laughs> so, we have a mover. Do we have a seconder? Barry, well done. So, one note the content. Oh, oh. I'd like to say the thing for the questions. And I've got more to say. Thank you. I want to say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to say thanks. I was part of the climate reference group, and you know, we had a draft conference that I didn't love. And um, you guys came to the party. It is really, it blew me away. Um, I look, I, setting aside that you know everything's not perfect and it's a plan to make plan and, and so on and so forth, it, it took such a giant leap. Um, and look, at, yes, I, I totally take on board Professor Higgins' comments and um, 
in the CRG's comments, but I think everybody's looking to take a leap forward. Everybody needs a bit of inspiration, otherwise it's just all too much. So um, look, I, I hope we can all get behind this because it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Michelle, for everything you've done as well. Um, thank you, gentlemen. It's been, um, it's fantastic. So um, I just want to say something else. What was it? The reason I love it, <laughs> this is the important bit. The reason I love it is you've actually touched on optimum visitation levels and you're talking about capacity and you're talking about leakage, starting to talk about the things that we actually have to talk about. And I'm really hoping that this will, from this will springboard to a conversation that the community needs to have about visitor numbers and levels and what's right. Not we hate tourism, we love tourism, but a more sophisticated discussion around what is right, um, and if we can get there, you will have achieved massively. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to put it to the vote. <laughs> One, note the contents of the report, and two, endorses the destination management plan for the district. All those in favour? Aye. 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 All those against? No one. Mm -hmm. no, it's, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Item four, page 62. Retrospective approval of remuneration authority submission. Over to you. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, you've already been given the opportunity to review the proposal um, informally. Um, this is a procedural item. And, um, when authority has received our proposal on the 26th of January. So I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Or comments? You want to comment? I just want to make it very clear that there's very little room to discuss anything else anyway. The, the amount of money available has been set aside or set, and the, the pro rata rates on how it's distributed has basically been set and agreed by the vote by the remuneration authority. So we, we don't really have much room to move on it anyway. Okay. It seems to me. Do have a move? question why no, the question why why did we didn't get it in earlier? Why didn't we we missed the first determination? How come that happened? The um, we need the we need all the positions of responsibility identified. Um, there were some discussions in the council and there around a number of committees that resolved until Quick question. To stop that happening ever again, is there a process that we can put in place so that when, once an election is finished and we have our members, that there's some sort of procedure that we go through that things get tipped off and, and done so that it never happens again? Is that, that possible? Um, Chuck it on the list. <laughs> I can't guarantee that, but um, it's much easier when you've got a returning mayor and a bulk of returning councillors. For example, the, the previous 2019 election, we had it all resolved. Oh, sorry, I should be clear. What I mean is, it wasn't obviously flagged up as a thing. So, is there some process that we go through when we get into the council um, that these things need to be done? So, be, be we can you know, keep them in mind and have that procedure. And can we just put well, to the list? Yeah, I think we know we need to do these. I mean, I think, um, you know, in, in this circumstance, in the previous um, directions by the Living Authority, the timing that we adopted wouldn't have been a problem. Um, for, in terms of setting anything, what this has done is a, is a change in the way they've interpreted it. As Stu said, uh, I think if, if um, you know, we're very much at the direction of council in terms of the timing in which they seek to make appointments, uh, if that happens quicker, and it's obviously generally quicker with the returning council and the returning mayor, then that's something we can do. Uh, we can you know, expedite, I suppose, uh, if it works. Okay. The question was, um... According to the street, it, have, it had to be in by 27th of January. Well, we're still talking about it now. So we submitted the proposal. We had a workshop on the 26th. Oh, that's right. We did have, yeah, okay. Yeah. It, just, it would just be you know, nice if it could be flagged up for the mayor so they could make a choice about whether um, whether they wanted to delay and people would miss out or not. Because I know one member was appointed quite quickly, although not officially, and there were sort of duties begun, but then so the remuneration is It's just yep. to make sure okay. it doesn't happen again. Thank you. I mean, look, there's things that we clearly need to follow up behind the scenes on this. I don't think I need to wash the, the laundry and dirty in public on this, but 
there is absolutely no question that this council should have approved the rates earlier than this, at the very least at the 15th of December. And, um, you know, that is a big disadvantage of a number of us. So that's the lot of the thing. Seconder, So one, that the contents of the report. Two, agree the remuneration rates for councillors of the Queenstown Lakes District Council for the period following the 2022 election to 30 June 2023 as follows. A, Deputy Mayor, 56,308 per annum. Committee Chair, 52,675 per annum. And Councillor, 45,410 per annum. All those in favour? Um, all those against? Yeah, motion carry. Thank you, Stuart. Five, page 71 on your papers. Otago Regional Council, RPS, re-notification of freshwater planning instrument, submission for retrospective approval. That was interesting. Um, local speeches, thank you. Uh, uh, so I'll be speaking to the item um, on behalf of Jean. So as you probably will know, the the Otago Regional Council Regional Policy Statement is a, is a reasonably important document for our district. Uh, we have to amend our plans uh, to make sure that we get a big and our resource consent decisions also have to make sure that they have regard for it. So it has some significant implications for the way we manage our resources in the district. So the submission outlines how we generally support the, the freshwater instrument provisions, but that we request a number of changes and amendments, and uh, those are generally summarised in the submission, but happy to take any questions on um, any of those. Questions, councillors? All move. Oh, yeah. you second. You're second. Right. I'll just say thanks. Just thank you for addressing the allocation issue. Okay, you. so one, no, the contents of the report, and two, Approve retrospectively the contents of the proposed regional policy, policy statement for renotification of the freshwater planning and planning instrument submission. All those in favour? Aye. 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 All those against? Motion carried. Thank you. Six, Chief Executive's report. Over to you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, councillors will see the, the four items there and um, Happy to talk to those. I know that I know that Councillor Gladding has raised an email earlier uh, today on the training agreement and some additional wording there. Um, and and I, I do wonder, uh, Mr. Mayor, if we just go through these item by item, but there may be some questions on the Wanaka Asset Sale Reserve as well. So happy if, if you want to take any questions, perhaps on the training agreement first. So, so if you want to speak to yeah, thank you. Um, look, it's I've sent an email around to councillors just last night. I went and had a look at the um, Canterbury Mural Forums um, way of doing things, and it seemed to me that it was an awful lot better than the Otago Mural Forums way of doing things, just a lot more advanced in terms of transparency. It's great that we've got a website, every submission, every report they do is up on the website for the public to see what they do, for the other councils to see what they do. It looks like, um agendas and minutes and reports are proactively shared with the rest of the table, which I think is really important through the three waters. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of difficult to know the positions that were being put forward, and it may be that there was nothing going on that anyone didn't want to go on, but it would have been nice to know what was going on, what was being said. So I just think given that we're local government, we have an obligation to be transparent in everything we do. Um, the Local Government Act mandates specifically um, that, that the mayors kind of get to do this stuff on their own. So I think in principle, we have to make sure that we know what's going on and that we feed into that, that process. It's a great group, like we need that advocacy, but I think it needs to represent the table and the community rather than just the voices of the people that are there. So I don't know what I don't know what the answer is because there's a lot of different wording and obviously the mural forums already everyone's agreeing their piece. I, I think for me internally, because I think Alban sort of suggests that um, the individual councils can decide how the information from that forum is distributed. I'd like for us to agree officially that, that the minutes and the agendas and so on come down 
to the rest of the councillors. You can engage with it as much as you like. At least we have access to that information like all the councillors in Hanbury do. Um, and then I think it would be nice if, if the mayor could sort of maybe mention to the mural forum that there might be some room for improvement and how could they look at doing that so that the public could see what they do. It might make it a stronger route as well. I'll take that on board. Um, my initial take on the group is I think this, because a lot of new mayors are still trying to find their feet with it yeah. and the secretariat's not that well funded and supported. So I, I presume that Canterbury one has a lot more money behind it from different councils. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, I can easily share them. And I've only had one agenda sent through. Okay. To me, so I just wonder, wonder if we could make a place on our website um, for you know that sort of thing, and then the public can have a look if they want to. Not many people will be interested, but it's sort of a conduit to what's going on in Central sometimes. Maybe uh, there is a, there is actually I thought there was actually an Otago Mural Forum website that may be a very simple blank page. I don't know. If you find <laughs> I didn't find it. Um, because uh, I know that that's been discussed, and um, if there is that, we could just provide a link from our mm -hmm. own website to that website. Um, you know, I, I think you know, we. I don't think there's. Um, we have been as a as C is advising the the uh, the mayoral form have been uh, encouraging that to produce like a, a summary of each meeting so that it can be circulated back to the council so all councillors can see the same thing. So I think you know those sort of suggestions that you've highlighted in your email are, are something that could easily be um, could easily be picked up and done. I'm happy to either for Glenn or myself to take that back to the mayoral forum and I can report back. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd take the support of what Nicky said and I think you know, you'd start to see the agendas and minutes would be great. Okay. Thanks, guys. Just a, um, a comment uh, on the funding for the conversion of the former Mike 10 building and uh, the additional million dollars that's required out of the assets um, uh, sale reserve fund. Um, it probably would have been good if, if that could have been put past the Monica Up and include the community board before. It was um, approved. Um, if, if, if this is delayed, is that going to cause any problems? Um, I think it will create some risk, but if Council wants to send it back to the upper field, upper field, the community board, um, that's certainly its choice. I think the recommendation from staff will be exactly as you have it uh, in front of you today. That, that was a position that was discussed with the community board. Uh, and and with council, that was sort of the agreed intention. But yes, it, it will create some risk because we won't have all the funding in place. We're about to receive the tenders, but um, we can work around that. It will just create a little bit more delay by another six weeks. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I have to compress. I, I I think it has to go back to the community board, I think. Uh, I wasn't on the community board that discussed it previously. Um, and we also need to see what are the options. This is one option. Uh, if, if there wasn't any, it wasn't a community asset reserve fund, what would we be looking at? Um, and we've got to be, be careful here. We've got to be consistent. I don't know if Queenstown has an asset reserve sale fund. It's, this is coming out of Wanaka money. Uh, and you could say, Okay, what happens when we want to put a building on Ladies Mile down there, community building? Are you going to take it out of the Queenstown Asset Reserve Fund or are you going to go to the annual plan and all ratepayers and district pay for it? So we, uh, you know, we've used this fund a couple of times now to fix up gaps like the Lugger Hall, which I argued against in the public forum. Um, and I'm not saying we don't do this, but I think we need to see that the community board with a, with a couple of options so that we say, and the implications of it and just keep in mind the big picture when we're looking at other uh, spending money on other community facilities in the district from now on. Uh, perhaps I could comment with respect, um, Councillor Cox, the decision about the direct funding, i.e. the million dollars and the covering the grants is a decision that has already been made. So those commitments have been made. Yep. Um, the, the only, this, this change was uh, a, a, a different mechanism. So whilst it, it's, uh, draws down money from the reserve, it also seeks to pay that money back. So it's simply a funding mechanism rather than an additional amount of funding from the community. 
So, so it's really only giving us that ability where we had one, um, one element in the funding model that we decided actually was going to be uh, cost prohibitive and going to cost council and the community more. Then um, this interim one was uh, this was a solution to enable us to get there and to be neutral to uh, both the Skir Heights Fund uh, and the community at large. Okay, thank you. I can speak to that too. I mean, I agree that you know we agreed to fund a million dollars into the thing, but just the sports facilities are district wide rated for a reason. They they spread the cost across the um, the district. Um, you know, it's I, we're we're between a rock and a hard place now because you're saying we're either facing a delay or forced to agree this today, and that's a Clayton's decision for us today because the process should be that it, um, you know, that the the board had oversight over that allocation, um, and equally, I think as Lyle said, that the options, including funding it from rates district wide, have to be presented to us as an option. Um, for us to make the call on. Now, we know the situation's difficult in terms of moving forward on rate pay of, on rating funded investment, but we need to, to know so that. It's not just, sorry, so when you say us, who do you mean? Well, no, the council know that we're in a difficult situation around funding in the next annual plan or moving forward. No, no, forward. no, no, sorry, I'll back it up. When you say us with sorry. regards to looking at the options. Well, well, for, the, the community board need to have that option in front of them so they can understand whether to allocate or well, to recommend that money from that. I accept the decision sits with council, but the practice has always been that that fund has been largely at discretion of the community board. And, um, and but equally, we can't afford a delay. I mean, this, this project has been delayed and overrun on and on, we need to get it delivered. So I, I don't know what the answer is unless we can commit to um, funding it one way or the other and having that discussion on the side so that we work out where it comes from. I mean, there's no question we have to fund it. The question is, where does the money come from? So uh, we need to allow that to play out. Just a, just a quick question. The committee board meeting on the 16th, could we, could, is it too late to get it on that agenda? That shouldn't be too late to get it on that. But, but the next like, council meeting will be the end of March. So you you say that the community board hasn't got the delegation to no. use that? Okay, that. The community no. board has the delegation to make a recommendation to council on how that's used. I'd go back to the point, though, that we're not talking about core funding. That has been no, agreed no, we're by council. We're talking about how we're actually bridging the gap by using a journal entry um, use of a reserve that actually gets repatriated back to the community. So we can't do the journal entry from somewhere else. <laughs> but, that, but, but it's also money that won't be available from the asset fund close to 10 years. Well, no, well, I think that, again, you know, I think you look, look at this practically. This is a, this is a um, management entry by the council. The opportunity is there for the council, should something come forward from the community board? And you know, in the, in the time I've been here, the community board has been very careful about releasing funds from that. And clearly we would address that if something came forward that would actually draw down that nominal fund. So I don't think you should, that that's not um, a, a, the basis of being concerned. As I said, I, you know, if council wishes to take it back to the community board, well within its ability to do so. But we can't do that without a delay, inherent delay. Well, we can't do that without an inherent delay, but e equally, um, we'll be working with whatever tender we've got. Um, and it may be that we're not in the, we don't have the, at that point a position where we have the funding support. Can I suggest if we do this that we issue an official sort of apology through this to the community board for not allowing them to exercise the delegation? It's just a we've, we've come under flat for not, um, you know, maybe giving them sufficient power and then we we'll can do things like this, even that's a mistake, it's intentional, we would have loved to have gone through them first. I just think it, it pays to recognise that if it goes through. Um, I, don't, well, I, mean, I don't know if we, the community board needs an apology, it's really the, the visibility to the public of what's going on and uh, understanding the process. So. I, know, I don't want to hold the project up. I understand it's alone. I hear what you're saying, Mike. Um, but I do think we need to message this through to the other community board members and to the community what, what it actually means. 
Did anyone email through? Did anyone get a sense from the other community more members? I would find that you know, in the last community, we were a little bit. This was decided or added in some way in the last community, which I mean, that would be I don't think we'd better comment on behalf of the other board members without that same motion. I'm leaving it up to the board of council to take it. Well, I think from like the community's point of view, um, what would be better in the overall scheme is to see this delivered earlier rather than later. Um, and I think, you know, it's just a, a learning moment um, and we've already heard the comments that other community board members have felt. Um, and so I think we don't have to, well, my opinion is that um, I'm really looking out for the community's best interests to not delay things further. It's not necessarily. I'll just remind councillors that when you're at this table, you're thinking of the district. I know. Monica has an interest in this, but you're also thinking of the district when you're at this table, so just keep that in mind, please. Okay. Do we have a mover or all? Do we have? So, um, oh, just to be, because we're, we're sort of haven't adopted any of these at all, it'd be nice to know whether there's going to be a direction um, before, before we, uh, and then perhaps move all these towards the end of the discussion. Thoughts on one of item three. Oh, put it to the vote. Mm -hmm. well, there well, you go. It's a bit of a it's it's a high risk scenario because we're either faced with delay or disenfranchising the the board. So it's sort of not an easy um, um, situation. I you know I mean I I we're going back to the point I made before is that. Our sports facilities are intentionally rated district wide to spread the load across the district. We, you know, Wakatipu residents recently paid for the Luggett Hall um, with a contribution by the community board from the, um, the fund. Arrowtown Sports Pavilion had the Arrowtown Endowment Fund. They provided a, a bit of funding and council provide, you know, and, and community provided the rest. Um, you know, Queenstown Event Centre, Wanaka Recreation Centre, we are funded district wide on sports facilities. And as was mooted, you know, we will be, you know, this very similar situation to Ladies Mile, where what started out as a X amount dollar project has escalated for various reasons. Um, we will be called upon at, to, to fund a bigger project on Ladies Mile that will be funded by, in part, by Wanaka residents. So I don't understand why this isn't and can't be funded district wide. Uh, so, with, with respect to the first million dollars as a district wide contribution, that was a that was what the council put in the AP. So, what we're yeah. talking about is is we're talking about that different scope. So, there is already a mixed up model here. Right, and council and community board have already contributed to that. That's right. That's contributed a million, and and we had that nine hundred thousand, and we're still working as a contingency, and we're still working through to try and conclude the last of those. Um, those grants so that actually that's not a drawdown on the fund line. So I'm mindful that this facility is desperately needed and um, I'd be reluctant to expand the works and hold things up. Uh, but if we're going to move forward, I think it should be with the proviso that in the future, if there's any um, use or need yeah. that reserve fund, that it's well signaled to the, to the water graph with the community board in advance. Oh, look, I mean, I look, absolutely accept uh, it was well signaled. Um, there was a workshop that was well considered. I don't, uh, I don't a, think that's accurate to be fair. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's, that's my understanding, Councillor. Uh, and I've seen the workshop uh, material that was used. Um, the council, what, what ha didn't happen was it didn't go forward and get formally ratified by the board at the time. So, knowledge that that was, a, was an error. but. Uh, the matter was well canvassed. So just to alleviate your fears, Councillor, if we added another note in there to say, Council will note, note further drawdown on, this, on the reserve fund, uh, on the unless there is a recommendation from the one of the community board. Yeah, 
I'd, I'd be happy with that one. Can I just ask one more question? Sorry, I threw the chair. Okay. Yeah. Um, just um, where, where, where are we repaying this from? So effectively, it'll be re repaid. Um, it'll be repatriated from rates over time. So if, if it's if it's returned from general rate, then we're effectively having an argument about nothing, just the delay in time. That's yes. well. No, it's, it's no. I think that the issue, more to be honest, more so for councillors is the principle that this has come without and having that. formally yeah. gone through. But there's no, the there's fund. no cost loss or no impost on the on well, the it's funds. Not the specific to one account. The difference is you, you you're effectively having a an interest free mm -hmm. loan from the fund versus a a debt funded um, million dollars under the uh, account. That's, right. that's the difference. And, so um, the, 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 so the repayment will be have to be put into the long term plan. So we will progressively repay that into the step up. Okay. Before we go, is there any other questions on items four and five? None at all. Okay. What I propose to do is I propose to move one, two, four, and five. And then move to three. Okay. Okay. So I'll move items one, two, four, and five. Do I have a second? Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Three. So I'll read this one out, though. Approve the allocation of an additional one million from the Wanaka Asset Sale Reserve to the Park Fund for the conversion of the former Mitre 10 building to a community centre. This funding to be repaid in full over the first 10 years of the lease. No further funds from the Wanaka Asset Sale Reserve to be used without a, an adopted recommendation from the community. A resolution of yeah, resolution of the Wanaka Upper Clutha Community Board. Do I have a mover? Thank you, Barry. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Matt. Can I suggest an amendment that we may agree to? Could if we put this funding to be repaid in full over the first two years of the lease from the general rate? Oh, that's anyway, that's a real one. Is that assumed? That's a real that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So, Thank I just got one question. Just the, the thing you said about if we had a need for that money in the year five, for example, you mentioned that you know, just, if that's not written down anywhere in year five, I'm not going to call it one of years. We've got to move around a second, though. We can talk about that. I'm going to put it to the right. Serious. That ends it. Okay. Mover, seconder. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? Motion passed. I'm just no, yeah, yeah, no, I understand the centre where you know somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want a little sign? I know you. Yeah, I do. <laughs> right. I, I've yet to see the, the councillors. Calling that there. Right. <laughs> I move. You know where you live. Hang on. I move that the public be excluded from the following parts of the meeting. Confirmation of the public excluded minutes for December 2022 and item seven. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Nikki. All those in favour? Aye. 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 